Hey, everyone. Today's guest and co-host is an old friend of mine, the very talented Dan Fogler, who you know from the Fantastic Beast movies, Balls of Fury, The Walking Dead, The Goldbergs, and a million other things. Dan and I talk about his first job working for a moving company, his second job as the amazing Zoltar selling discontinued toys at FAO Schwartz, how he landed the role of playing Francis Ford Coppola in The Offer, losing his virginity, sage advice from Philip Seymour Hoffman, and a lot more. Our first call today is from Monica, whose boss continues to make unwanted advances despite her repeated rejections. Monica lives in Spain, and she would most likely lose her job if she were to call out the inappropriate behavior. Together, we try to formulate a plan that might have a more favorable outcome. Next, Dan and I talk with Rebecca, whose career as a Disney animator ended more than a decade ago when her department was shut down. Now, working as a medical assistant, Rebecca finds herself missing the art world and has begun pursuing the career she was forced to give up. Unfortunately, her husband is not supportive, and she can't understand why. As always, thank you for listening to our podcast. If you have a question and would like to talk with us, we would love to hear from you. Just look for the link at unqualified.com. Ladies and gentlemen, you are listening to Unqualified with your host, Anna Ferris. Dan! It is I. Dan and I were in a movie called Take Me Home Tonight that we shot in 2007 in Phoenix. It was an all-night shoot. We had only one day. Yeah. That was an experience, and I really want to reminisce about it. However, I'm really excited to talk to you about the offer because my husband and I are enjoying it so much. Will you tell me about your audition process? Yeah. So my representation said you got a big audition coming up. They want you to audition for Francis Coppola. I said, oh, my God. Okay. So they sent me the email. In the header, it said Francis Ford Coppola, but I got sides for Mario Puzo. So I got the sides, and I said, didn't you guys mention Francis? And they were like, yeah, but they're not looking for Francis quite yet. They're looking for Mario. Who's the author of The Godfather? Yeah, Mario Puzo. So I said, okay, great. Mario's a great part. These scenes are awesome. But could I also audition for Francis? You know, just because I got excited about it. And they said, sure. So they got me those sides as well. In those sides, if you watch the show, Puzo has a scene where he confronts Sinatra, or he and Sinatra butt heads in a restaurant. It's a fantastic scene. And then in another scene with Francis, he's talking to Al Pacino. So when I usually record my auditions, I do everything. So how do you do that, like technically? So I'll record like on a voice memo their lines. And I'll stop talking, but I'll keep acting like I'm saying my lines in my head right. for the timing. So you already have the musicality that you hear. Yeah. So what I ended up sending them was my audition for Puzo and for Francis and off camera for Sinatra and Pacino, which I don't know if I'd ever get Sinatra and Pacino, but at least, you know, they could see what kind of range I had. And I thought this is brilliant because that's what a director would do. He'd like do everything, you know? Yeah. So I felt like if I had never mentioned, hey, guys, can I try out for Francis? You know, if I never even mentioned that, right? I would have just been auditioning for Puzo. And then who knows who would have been Francis. Did you get Francis off of the tape or did they have you meet again? Like the reason why I'm interested in this is because oftentimes it can be difficult to shift a vision of a particular idea that a director or producer has. Yeah. Well, I made sure it was pretty drastic between Francis and Puzo. So for Francis, I had the beard. And it's crazy because I never would have thought that I would even be anywhere near the vicinity of Coppola. But I put my hair to the side and I put some glasses on and I was like, my God. Oh, completely. Yeah. I'm like, my gosh, I look like I'm related, you know. So that was very convincing in the moment to me during the audition. I was like, holy crap, I think I got a good shot at this, you know. And then for Puzo, I shaved these big glasses, you know, I basically did the look that he has and had a whole different thing. But I was like, I'm going to get Francis or they're going to really see this and say, wow, he really looks like Francis. And that's what happened. 
That's amazing. All the actors are incredible, including you. Thank you. Dan, will you tell us what was your first job and who was your first boss? Oh, my God. Wow. I guess my first legitimate job was when I was in college for like rent money, I would be like a mover. That feels like a rough one. It is. It's really hard manual labor, but I was like, okay, I'm killing several birds with one stone here. I'm making some money here, but I'm also exercising. And that was grueling, man. That was grueling, but it felt good to get paid at the end of the day. And They always say, oh, you're going to wait tables or whatever. And I was like, I never want to do that. I was like, from here on out after college, I'm only going to do things that have acting in it. So I would only take a gig if I was like semi-acting. I had this gig for a while at FAO Schwartz where I would sell like toys and stuff. And they would dress you up in these costumes. This is horrendous. This is like my first job out of college. They would dress you up in costumes. Like what kind of costumes? Like teddy bears? Yeah. If you were tall, you got to be one of those big guys, the guards at the front of FAO Schwartz. (laughs) But you got to be outside the whole time and it could really suck. And you're just standing there the whole time. I had the pleasure of being the amazing Zoltar, you know, basically Zoltar from the movie Big. (gasps) Come to life! (laughs) It was so silly. I had a giant lavender turban, and I had this, like, cape with this huge collar, and everything was just, like, silky and purple, and these shoes that twisted up. And I was on the third floor of F.E.O. Schwartz selling discounted toys. You know, come to Zoltar's Bargain Bazaar, okay? And I was able to improv and, you know, get kids to come and buy these defective toys. (laughs) But I was sharing the costume with seven other grown men. Oh, This dude just peeled it off of him after his shift and he handed me the costume with a bottle of Febreze and was just all, are you next? And I was just like, oh, God. The kids would be like, yay, we love Zoltar. And then they'd get within three feet and I'd be like, this is not Zoltar's smell. This is several other people's smell. (laughs) And like, oh, it was terrible as a young man trying to flirt with women and stuff. It was horrendous. (laughs) This is not me. I think that might be one of the best first job stories we've heard. That's pretty amazing. It has scarred me for life. That's all. (laughs) What advice would you give your younger self? In college, I learned everything is in cycles. And I guess like a more epic way of saying that is this too shall pass, basically. Do you remember like a specific moment when that concept sort of clicked? Yeah, I remember walking down the street, feeling down. And it was like the weather was affecting my mood. It was just gray and crappy. And I was like, what is the matter? Last week, everyone I saw, I was just high-fiving and... Everything was great and upbeat, and this week is just so blah. And I was just like, oh, yeah, well, maybe next week we'll be up again. I was like, that's the concept in a very simple way. Yeah. As an actor, the greatest lesson I learned, and I still have to remind myself, is from Philip Seymour Hoffman when he was on the Actors Studio. And he said, you're not going to get most of the roles you audition for. So you're just swimming in rejection, basically. So you have to use every audition and treat it like a final performance because you don't know if you're going to be able to play that part again. You know, you don't know if you're going to get a chance. So I was like, that is brilliant because you have a sense of satisfaction after you're done. You do your bow, you say thank you very much, and you move on. You're not sitting there going, oh, just pining away in your head and how things could have been. You say, okay, that was my performance and what's next? I'm acting. I am acting. I'm getting to go into these rooms and act. It was that humbling that allowed me to get the other roles that I wanted to later. I wasn't needing it. That was my performance. Thank you. I'm out of here. And I think it just worked out. How old were you when you first felt like you were in love? Oh, my God. I don't know if it was love, but I fell in love pretty easy, you know? (laughs) Jeez, I was in love with this girl, Christina, in like second grade. I was in love with this girl. I think I would like kiss this girl on the playground or something. And then I had my heart broken Valentine's Day. How old were you? I was in fourth grade. And I dressed up like Don Johnson for this girl. Like she she was like really into Don Johnson. (laughs) 
And I basically got like a white linen outfit and like a crazy light blue T-shirt and tried to get those shoes that he would wear with no socks. Put the mousse in my hair. I got the Valentine's Day chocolates and everything. I come in, we're having a great day, you know. It's like math and it was just going amazingly. And, you know, we're sharing looks and holding hands and stuff. And at the end of the day, 10 minutes before the frickin' day ends, before we go to the buses, and like I had no clue if anything was wrong. And she says, I have something really special to tell you. And I was just like, okay. I thought she was going to say, like, we are getting married, you know, whatever, though. We are going steady forever. And she takes me in this hallway, and she's like, I think I'm going to get back together with my old boyfriend from my block because it's just easier to be with him because he lives closer. And I was just like, what? I was just freaking devastated. I was like, you know how much mousse is in my hair right now? I got you Toblerones, lady. (laughs) She's practical. (laughs) Yeah, he's closer. Yeah, she didn't want a long distance relationship. She didn't want a long distance. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. Okay, so wait, what about later in life? Well, okay, so the worst was, I guess, the girl I lost my virginity to. I was pretty young. We were, I think, 14, 15, okay? And I thought, you know, this is it. You know, we're bonded forever. And it was tricky because it was like a one- or two-year kind of romance. And it was the kind of thing where it's like, oh, Dan and let's call her Schmathy. Dan and Schmathy. (laughs) Oh, they're always together. It's like, oh, Dan and Schmathy. Yeah, yeah. Peanut butter and jelly. You guys were an identity. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And when we broke up, it was like all my friends were her friends. Oh. My sophomore year of high school was horrendous because I was like, hey, yeah, I'd like to come bowling. And they'd be like, yeah, well, Kathy's going to be there. It was just like, oh, okay. I didn't just lose my girl. I lost all my friends. Oh, my God. And you guys had the sexual experience at a young age where it's hard to mentally. Oh, yeah. Extremely hard to get your brain around that. And, like, I didn't really have anything like that again until, like, senior year, you know. People are being like, I just had my first kiss. And I was like, get the hell out of here, man. (laughs) I've lived, you know. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my God. Yeah. That's tough. Yeah, but that was a huge lesson because that was really a bad time, very lonely time. But it was like I still got by, still did my things. I made new friends. I said to each one of them, one of the times is going to come back to me and say, sorry about that. You were right. She was a little wacky, you know, whatever. (laughs) That's what happened. They all eventually one by one came back and they're all my friends still. Really? Yeah. Do you have a lot of friends from that time in your life? Yeah, definitely. I mean, a lot of people dispersed, but my close, close, the ones that really, it was the most painful, you know, that I couldn't hang out with them because of Schmathy. (laughs) They're like family. Yeah, that's amazing, though. That's a formative story. Yeah. Hey, Monica. Hi, Monica. Hi. You're here with my dear friend, Dan Fogler. We've known each other for years. Thank you for your letter. Will you tell us what's going on? Since a few years ago, I have been working at this job. And at this job, I have this manager. And this manager, since the beginning, he's been saying things like, oh, my God, you're so pretty. We're perfect for each other. When are you going to marry me? Like that type of stuff. And I have always set him down because I don't want to give anybody false hope. Although sometimes I don't know if he's joking or not. I just, I don't know. And I am a friendly person. So it's not like I hate him or anything. I'm friendly. But like a few weeks ago, we got into a disagreement. And ever since then, I just don't know how to treat him. I get very annoyed at him every time that he says those type of things. And I don't know what to do, how to talk to him without getting mad. Because like, he's my manager. I don't want to be like, can you stop saying the stuff? It's very obvious that I'm annoyed at that type of stuff. 
but it's like he doesn't listen. Oh. oh, Monica, I'm so sorry. I don't know what to do. You want the hard answer or the easy answer? Both. Okay. Now, how much do you love your job? Not very much at the moment, but it's not like I can change jobs, sadly. You can't, okay. Okay, so you got to tolerate the scenario. Yeah, at least for a few more months. Okay, I have kind of a Band-Aid solution, but what do you think, Anna? Well, it's tricky. He's your supervisor. I remember when my boss slapped me on the ass and I just giggled. Oh, God. I know. I didn't know what to do. I was so shocked. Anyway, that was my shutting down. Yeah. No, mine is very firm. I'm very firm about it. I'm like, no, that's never going to happen. You're not my type. You might think that I'm perfect for you, but you are not at all perfect for me. And I don't want to go on a date with you. Like, that's the type of stuff that I say. I'm clear. Are you in the States, Monica? Oh, I'm in Madrid. We're dealing with a cultural <laughs> thing too, perhaps, right? Because nowadays... There's like legal repercussions here for inappropriate behavior. Yeah. So, Dan, what do you think? If you want to tolerate it without things escalating, if you think you can basically, you know, keep avoiding him, just surfing this until the next few months is up. Mm. You ever heard of transcendental meditation? Dan, that was not what I was expecting. No. Well, <laughs> it allows you to be in a situation that's uncomfortable even while you're in it, you're able to rise above it and kind of surf it. Now, in Buddhism, there's a kind of transformative alchemy that happens where you can take what he's giving you and you can say, oh, this person is an extension of me. This is a brother in the human race. Mm. Okay? Yeah. And that alone can give you a lot of compassion for somebody. Now, if you're seeing them as a brother, just saying that can also help them figure out what position they are in your life. Yeah. And you can say it sweetly with love, you know. It's just all about saying things with love and compassion. So if you don't want to go that far, you can just, instead of cringing every time the guy talks, you can go, oh, this guy is pretty lonely. This guy needs somebody in his life. It's not me. But that can also garner some compassion for the guy. It's kind of sad. It feels like what you're speaking to is applicable for every situation, yeah. essentially. Yeah. With coworkers in the past where if I'm agitated when I'm around them, it tends to grow like psychologically, mm -hmm. yeah. like something's feeding it. And then some part of me is also enjoying the feeling of, like, I hate that person so much. <laughs> yeah. So kind of the idea of, as actors, when we have to smile a lot in a scene, eventually it'll sort of take over your body. Hmm. It's a Band-Aid to get through it. Yeah. There's other ways. But if you want to be able to get through it without rocking any boats, upsetting anybody, mm -hmm. you create that little force field for yourself. But there are more extreme ways of dealing with it, of course. Like what? Well, the more extreme is obviously just walking away. The more extreme is scratching the record, you know? Mm -hmm. You say, this is how you're making me feel, man. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you're making this really hard for me. I really want to stay here. I want to work. I mean, that can be very abrasive to somebody. What I told you is something that you're able to surf the waves that the guy's given you without, you know, getting in too much trouble. Mm. There's also a little acting work you can do here where mm. the guy says something and you go, oh, you're so funny. <laughs> I've done that too. Yeah. Oh. Like, I love how you're always joking with me. You know, brother, I love how you're always joking with me. <laughs> Just really put him in this place. That would really fuck with his head. <laughs> because, Monica, it sounds like he's enjoying this sense of control. Yeah. I'm sure yeah. he sees that you get uncomfortable. How do you think he would react if you got up the nerve without smiling and saying, dude, this makes me really uncomfortable. I don't like it at all. I really would appreciate if you stopped. How do you think he would respond to something like that? I don't know. Actually, I mean, he's a very cheerful person and everybody gets along with him. But I have been short with him. I've been very firm in what I don't like about him. And obviously, I'm uncomfortable, but I don't know how would he take it. Yeah. He might even be even worse 
if I actually say that. Right. I don't know. I mean, is there like a supervisor you could go to? There's a supervisor, yes, but my boss really loves them. Right, right, right. right. And what's hard about your situation as well is that it's hard to say to anybody, well, he always jokes with me. Would I marry him or that I look good today or whatever? But it's the accumulation. It sounds like this is all the time. Yeah, it's been almost two years and a half, not counting the lockdown. And I'm just very tired of it. Well, here in the States, I think you could scare him with an email or talk with HR. Hmm. But I don't know how it is in Spain. Does he say these things in front of other people? Yeah. He has said those type of things in front of my other co-workers. And my other co-workers, they never say anything because I always very cold about it. But I don't know what would I do if I have to do that. I think it's a growth experience for you, too. Mm. It's like he's behaving like a child that feels controlling over you. And he enjoys that. So it might be a really good emotional exercise for you to just be like, stop now Mm. and then just leave it. It doesn't have to be long. He'll be embarrassed, but he should be. Yeah, let's hope so. That's sort of my two cents, Monica. I'm really sorry. Truly, like, if you were in the States, we could say... Get him fired. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Get him out of there. It's not appropriate. Yeah, but the thing is, he's so close with my boss. Like, they do a lot of things together. They are very, very close to each other. So if I were to talk to my boss, even though she's a woman as well, and I'll tell her, yeah, this makes me uncomfortable or whatever, it's more probable that I will be the one getting fired. Right. I hear you. I think that for the time being, I mean, maybe if you can look for other jobs, start doing that Mm. because you don't want to live filled with that kind of agitation. It feels awful. It like gnaws away at you at like hunger. Mm. This is one job at one point in your life. And it does sound like you are in an unusual position where there's a high risk factor for you keeping this job if you do much. So see how you can protect yourself emotionally while you slowly make a decision on this. Yeah. I'm so sorry, though. What a creep. And I'm sorry he's trying to take your power away from you and make you feel small. And it is a very childish behavior. And sometimes he asks for a hug. Oh, no. And I'm like, no, thank you. No. But I behave very well today. I deserve a hug. And I'm like, no. Yeah. Oh, Monica. I think you got to be proactive in a job hunt. Wow. Yeah, probably. Yeah, because even if you really like this job, it may be time to move, you know? I don't know what employment's like. It's kind of the same as in the U.S. now. Yeah. Like, it's very hard to find one that has good pay and everything. You got any, like, big dude friends or yeah. someone that could, like, come and pick you up every once in a while and you can say is your boyfriend? Yeah. <laughs> I have a tall friend, but my supervisor is also very tall. Doesn't have to be big. Just has to be someone that you can say, I'm seeing somebody and this is not cool for you to do this. Just someone who could be that representation for you. Totally. That's a good idea, Dan. Or if you're feeling frisky, you know, walk in with a lady friend and say... Hi, (laughs) this is how I'm rolling. (laughs) Well, I am bi, so that can't work. (laughs) Well, do that then. Even if it's a friend or somebody, just say, hey, I'm really smitten with this person. That might work. Yeah. Yeah. And Monica, too, like in terms of outside of your work life, Hmm. have some fun. Go out. Get your mind off of that. You know what I mean? Distract yourself. Enjoy life beyond work. I don't want you going home and just like sitting in that agitation. Yeah. Can you go out more? Go meet some people. Start dating. I haven't tried dating in a while, but it's hard to go out, but I'll try. Yeah, do. Cultivate some of your friendships. Maybe start dating again because you'll carry a different energy into work because you'll feel it. You won't have as much time for the hatred for your boss. And I hate him for you, too. I can carry some here. (laughs) Lean on me. (laughs) And Dan's advice is powerful. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard, though. I think it's really hard. 
It is, but it's really quick to learn transcendental meditation. You can learn in like basically a weekend. Mm. Once you get a handle of it, oh my God, you can really get through a lot of chaos. I'll check that out. I'll see which option it's better for me, the back one or the other one. Yeah, because you don't have to put the pressure on yourself to do it now. I mean, I've been with this for some time now. And after this call, I feel like it's something that I have to do. Like, yeah. Oh, good. Then do it. <laughs> If it feels good and feels right for me to tell you to go fucking bark at him, yeah. if that feels like a relief to you, then I think it's important. You know, you don't have to get into any details. You just need to make it loud and eye contact. Mm. I've practiced that at home. Yeah. Thank you so much for the advice. Oh, Monica, thank you. Good luck. I'm thinking about you. Thank you. You got this. Thank you so much, guys. Bye, Monica. Bye. Bye. Man, that's tough. So transcendental meditation, huh? Yeah, I can teach you. I know a good teacher, but it's pretty easy. You just create a mantra for yourself. All right. Once you figure out what the mantra is, you can really go to that mantra while things are chaotic around you. And it's like a nice little security blanket in your mind. I'm into that. Hi, Rebecca. Hello. How you doing? Rebecca, you're here with Dan Fogler. He is a dear friend of mine. Will you tell us what's happening? Well, I started out my career, I guess, more than 20 years ago <laughs> at Walt Disney Feature Animation as an animation artist. And that was fantastic. I had a really great time doing that. I was a traditional animator. And then they closed down traditional animation in 2003. And I became a freelance artist for another 10 years. And then I took care of my parents when they became ill. And my freelance career kind of went belly up. And it was during that time that I met my husband. He met me as kind of this failed illustrator who had studied to become a medical assistant to pay the bills, have steady health insurance, all that. And now I've hit 51 <laughs> and I'm at midlife crisis time. And I really miss the art world. I really feel like I need it back. I just feel like my life is flat without it. And my husband and I talked about it seriously about me going back to that and taking it on part time to restart the business as a freelance illustrator. And he was in on it initially. I felt like I had his support. And eventually I moved on to a four day week instead of a five day week as a medical assistant. And as we went forward, I think I'm in my third year going after it. I'm still building on it and I'm not getting great jobs. It's a struggle. And I don't know why that is necessarily. I go after as much work as I can. You know, finding the work that pays well is hard. But it's also becoming a struggle at home with my husband because I'm not making big bucks at it yet. And I'm starting to feel like his frustration level with it has grown. I'm starting to get comments about the amount of money that I'm making on the jobs, that it's not enough to really justify what I'm doing, that maybe I should go back to a full week as a medical assistant and just make this more of a hobby. In your letter, you mention his comment about your short hair as well. <laughs> I love my husband. He's awesome. And he says wonderful things a lot of the time. He doesn't have a great filter. Like he will say things without processing them first. And this was just something that came up over dinner. We were talking about the Jada Pinkett Smith thing that happened at the Oscars. And I had seen a trailer for a documentary called Good Hair. And I was talking to him about it. I'm very film oriented. I love everything movies. I always have. So I talk about film all the time. And this one was about hair for women and how it defines them sexually or can define them sexually. And I brought it up and he said, yes, hair is sexual. The next thing out of his mouth was G.I. Jane. And I'm like, how do you not take that personally? Well, what's the context behind the financial? We're doing really well financially. We own our own house. 
outright. He makes a very good living. So why isn't he fully supporting you? Yeah. With your decision, if it's not a money thing. Yeah. Why even bring up that you're not making enough money if you guys are stable? That's just not something he feels is appropriate. He feels like we should both pull our own weight. But that's when you're getting to the place you guys are there. I know. I know. Okay, so that's a flawed argument. G.I. Jane is pretty hot. Yeah. That's another flawed argument. So he fell in love with a certain dynamic. Yeah. But you guys are married. There's an evolution. And he has to love that evolution. And he has to love that you love it. He's got to be a smart enough gentleman to know that if you're loving what you're doing, then you're going to be loving life and loving yourself. And he benefits from that. Mm -hmm. Are you willing to go all the way with what you love, which means that you really have to focus even more on it? <laughs> you have to, you know, go full into it. And you have to be able to be malleable enough to learn the new playing field. I mean, is that what you want to do? It's what I'm doing right now. I get up every morning at 4.30 to work the jobs that I am getting. And I try to work a full day Friday, which is my day off. But my husband treats it as my day off. <laughs> he gets home and he's like, if you don't have a job on your desk, then we should do something. And I'm like, well, if I don't have a job on my desk, then I should be pursuing jobs. So that's another point of contention. But yes, that's what I'm doing. I have a website up that I have built from the ground floor. I'm learning how to play social media. That is the new game rather than art directors, which is how it worked back in the day. I had relationships with art directors straight up. What are they all doing, all your old cronies? I have contacted a few of them, but I haven't gotten any leads from it. What kind of medical professional are you? Medical assistant. And I earn pretty good money doing it four days a week. Is he missing you when he says, I want to be with you? Or what does that mean when you guys do do something together when you aren't working? Yeah, he is missing me. He feels like we don't spend enough time together. It used to be, well, I only see you on the weekends, so we should have Saturday and Sunday totally together. And when I was working five days a week, he wanted both days. And I was bargaining for having at least one day fully for the art. You have a coach or a counselor? For? Marriage counselor? He won't. <laughs> he won't do it. Oh, he won't do that? No. When you guys spend time together, what do you do? Usually go into the city like three or four times a month. And we go to museums. We're actively together when we're doing stuff. So when you tell him how happy pursuing this makes you, and you really want to give it your all, and maybe you'd like to quit being a medical assistant so you can dedicate all that time and then you guys can have your weekends or whatever. Does he still go back to a financial-based counter-argument? Yeah. I mean, he's like, well, you wouldn't have your health insurance. And that is one thing. The health insurance is something that I do really need. His job has really crappy health insurance. So we would have to be paying for health insurance. Gotcha. What does he do for the... He is a maintenance engineer for a lid manufacturing company, <laughs> but he likes his job. Was that his first choice? He did a lot of different things. You guys have kids? No kids. In your letter, you write, I am euphorically happy when I am illustrating. And your husband isn't really grasping that. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you have to tell him this again and again. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's funny because a lot of the stuff that I do, he's very proud of. He has almost every illustration I've ever done on his phone. And he will show them to people, especially my comic book covers. But when I take jobs... He will ask me how much I'm being paid for them. And I've gotten to the point where I'm just straight up lying. I will inflate the amount that I'm getting paid because otherwise we'll just get into an argument. Why are you taking that job? They're not paying you enough. And then he'll start breaking down how much I'm getting paid per hour as if I were getting paid per hour. Oh, no, that makes you feel horrible. Yes. Because you would do it as a hobby, I'm sure. Yes, but if I'm doing it as a hobby, then I should be working 40 hours a week. Right, right. Oh, God, you've already had this conversation. Shit. <laughs> Look, sometimes you just have to follow your heart. You got to follow your dreams. And you need a partner that's going to support you in that. That's the bottom line. That's it. 
It's just like, honey, the bills are paid. What is the problem here? Are you scared of change? Do you need the status quo? When we got married, it wasn't about being stagnant. It was about growing together. You know, remind him of these things. Remind him that he loves your creativity. Yeah. Tell him that you love it that he has your illustrations on his phone. How happy that makes you. That you love it how proud he is of you. And Dan is exactly right. This is about a large picture. You guys have both kind of gotten on this particular train of stress. It's about time. He wants your time. It's the same thing. Like, we got kids here with my wife. We have to schedule dates. And that's something that you really got to do. Every time you get a gig, you have to also schedule some fun time with him. Yeah. It's even more work. You have to constantly work to balance everything if you want to live in harmony. Yeah. I've been trying. (laughs) It's a, yeah. It's hard. Yeah. Yeah. I think when I try to schedule it, I think he weighs it in balance with how much I'm earning per job. And it's hard. You have to make that a moot point. Yeah. It's unfortunate that he's focusing so much energy on that aspect of this. And he's really kind of gone down that rabbit hole with it. And that is how he singularly looks at your new drive in life. I wonder if it's going to be on you for a minute to continue to reiterate how much you love it, how amazing it is for you, and how you love being in a relationship with a partner who's letting you grow and, you know, make it up. It's an okay tactic. You can say thank you so much for being so supportive. And remind him that this is almost like you're going to med school and having to work a job. You are at that point where you have to hustle really hard until you get the big job that will shut them up. But right now, you have to be scrappy with it. When you do have the time together, keep it diverted. Or tell them things like, I just love it that you show people my illustrations, that you're so proud of me. Focus on other things so you can continue to distract him. Like, let's go on this hike. Or what did you think about that thing? It's like a classic 80s movie, you know, where you just got to stick to your guns and and it'll all pay off in the end, you know. Just follow your heart. If he can't get behind that, then there's a bigger problem. Mm -hmm. And Rebecca, keep at it. Keep hustling. There's a lot of opportunity for animators right now and female animators. Yeah. You know, I can help you with that kind of thing. If you reach out... At the very least, you can say, oh, I'm talking to Dan Fogler and he's doing this and I'm making connections here so that he can see that, oh, okay, sounds like a smart guy, you know, he can put two and two together. But if that's the thing that scares him, that's what you got to focus on. If he's scared of the change, you have to just reassure him that you're not going to lose the woman you love. Right. The woman you love is going to be even more in love with the life. Yeah. I think if I could actually make some kind of real job or real money, at least one or two, I think he would start to see it as something actual as opposed to a frustrating hobby. (laughs) He just talks about it as me being used by the people that I'm working for. And he says he's frustrated by that. So you should say this allows me to be my own person. Yeah. This is mine. Mm -hmm. This belongs to me. You should be able to understand that. Mm -hmm. I know that maybe it's not a great thread to pull with him, but he should know that we've all done a lot of work for free. Yeah. A lot of favors, a lot of like underpaid work. Mm -hmm. You just got to do it. Mm -hmm. For the love of the game, yeah. 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 It's something that I'm familiar with in film and entertainment. I mean, it's not his world, so. (laughs) Right. I think you have some big things to think about, Mm -hmm. but I'm really impressed by you. Thank you. Congratulations on picking a lost dream up. And both Dan and I, I think we probably have both thought we wouldn't make it, (laughs) but knowing how much I love it and wanting to follow it because it gives me so much joy. So I'm really impressed that you recognize that life is short. 
I want to be happy. I want to feel that. Yeah. So good for you. You know the actor George C. Scott? You know when he started winning Academy Awards? Mm -mm. When he was 50. Wow. He was a struggling actor. And then he said, this is really hard for me. He went into the army. Mm -hmm. And he was digging a ditch. And he was like, screw this. And he took that life experience. And he became one of the greatest actors of our time. Wow. That's a great story. I had no idea, Dan. <laughs> yeah. While we still have Rebecca, I feel like it could be a cool time to maybe talk about your animation project. Yeah. You know, I'm living my dream here with Heavy Metal magazine. I watched Heavy Metal the movie when I was a kid. and I remember that. Yeah, they're now my publisher. I have three titles with them, Brooklyn Gladiator, Fishkill, and Moon Lake. Moon Lake is my Twilight Zone, Tales from the Crypt, heavy metal, you know, homage. And we're making an animated show out of it with Bardell Animation, the Rick and Morty animators. And this is a huge dream come true for me. And yeah, we have an all-star cast and we're in the middle of animating it now. And yeah, I come from theater and whenever I make a movie or I have a project, I call it Join the Caravan Productions, you know? If you show up, if you're passionate, if you're there, then you're gonna get to be part of it, you know? So I always keep the door open and then that's where a lot of people, when they feel free, and they feel like they're welcome. They give you gold, you know? Yeah, what an amazing sentiment. That's great. If you ever want to check out my stuff, it's online, RebeccaPearlIllustration.com. All right, RebeccaPearlIllustration.com. Rebecca, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I really hope something cool comes out of this. You do. Thank you for having me. Your stuff is great. I'm looking at it right now. It's really great. Oh, thank you. Oh, awesome. <laughs> what an yeah. unexpected, awesome thing to come from this. Yeah. <laughs> really good stuff. Nice comic book covers. Yeah, thank you, Dan. Yeah, excellent work. Thank you. Yeah, you guys have a good one. You too. Yeah, you too. Bye, Rebecca. Bye. Dan, thank you so much for doing that. <laughs> Sure. That was so cool. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, I miss you. I miss you too. And congratulations on everything. It's been so nice to see you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. Sure. Bye, Dan. Bye. Bye.